Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today I would like to tell you about the skeleton um, or the bare minimum of a category if you want, which is kind of a concept which is really, really cute and sometimes very useful and sometimes completely useless. So let's actually have a look what it could be or what the main motivation is and then how it actually works in practice. So um, I like this picture very much. I stole it, of course, uh, link to everything is in the description. So here's a funny quote. So getting information off the internet is like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. Uh, we all know that, right? So getting information off the internet might be pretty tricky. There's a lot of information on the internet. And in particular, there's something that is called uh, too much information, right? Just TMI. And TMI is not always preferable. It kind of has a negative flavor anyway, just the TMI. Um, so too much information might not be really preferable, might not be what you want to do, right? Information overload is certainly not preferable and it happens in real life as well as in mathematics all the time. Um, and kind of, it's really related to the internet. So it depends a little bit how you found this video. I hope at least this video is kind of helpful for what you had in mind. Maybe it's actually information overload. I can't quite tell, but anyway, in some sense, uh, really, it's not always, it's really not always preferable to have lots of data, right? We all know that. Sometimes it's just too much information. That's the whole point, right? In some sense, it's much better to somehow ignore, um, let me call them finer structures, right? So category theory is this bird's eye perspective anyway. So we can't really see or can't really do anything with finer structures. So maybe it's actually a preferable strategy to ignore that data, even if you haven't, kind of you ignore it. It's too much information and you kind of do something different. And skeletons fall exactly in this kind of philosophy. And sometimes they're super useful and really beautiful. And sometimes they're just, eh, hmm, no, I can't really tell. Um, we'll have a look at a really nice example in a second. So to be completely precise here, I have a category here that is some sense too big. It's a really beautiful category, but in some sense, it's still too big. My category, uh, so there's some field involved that I call K. You could think of Q or R or whatever your favorite field is. Um, I just call it K. So my favorite field, if someone wants to know, is actually this one here anyway. Uh, but anyway, so it just works for any field. Um, I'm off topic here. So F, finite dimensional vector spaces. It's a category of finite dimensional vector spaces. Well, objects are finite dimensional vector spaces and arrows are linear maps. And in some sense, it says way too much information. So here comes a funny theorem, um, not really hard to prove, uh, but if someone points it out to you for the first time, it's actually a little bit mind blowing. So two vector spaces, when are they actually isomorphic? That's a really, really easy way to decide whether they are isomorphic, keeping in mind here that I'm kind of in the finite dimensional world. So they are isomorphic if and only if they have the same dimension. The same works for infinite dimensional ones. You just have to be a little bit more careful what you mean by the same dimension. So, but anyway, let's ignore that anyway. And let's just say with finite dimensional spaces and that two vector spaces are isomorphic if and only if they have the same dimension. So you kind of have a lot of the, your isomorphism classes are huge. It's kind of too much information contained in this category. This category is too big in a certain sense. And what do you do in classical linear algebra already without knowing that you are doing it or without anybody ever telling you that you did it is you go to the skeleton. And the skeleton of this category is the category of matrices or in this case, K value matrices. There will be matrices of a certain field. Again, you can think of Q or R or whatever your favorite field is. I just write K. And it has actually a good size and it's equivalent to the original category. It's this idea that vector spaces and linear maps can be encoded by numbers and matrices. So what are the objects here? Well, the objects are just the natural numbers, the dimensions of your spaces, and the arrows are just the some matrices, some co corresponding matrices of hopefully the correct uh, M and N or N and M. And I can never tell which one is which. You know how a matrix looks like. The correct matrices, which are kind of the, the explicit forms of the uh, linear maps from before, which kind of the explicit forms in the sense of I've chosen the basis. And this set is this set, of course, it's not a set. This category has a much, uh, well, smaller number of objects because here two objects are isomorphic, they're just natural numbers, if and only if they're the same. 
right? So the only isomorphisms you can ever write down in this category would be square matrices. And square matrices are saying you have uh, the same objects anyway. So here, your isomorphism classes of objects are really tiny. And here, your isomorphisms of objects are really huge, right? Too much information in some sense. And uh, that's kind of the definition then of a skeleton. If you want, you just get rid of two, two big isomorphism classes of objects. A category S, I call it S, is skeletal if no two distinct objects are isomorphic. Right? All isomorphism classes are as small as they can be. They just contain precisely one element. And a skeleton of a category is just a skeletal category right? S equivalent to C. It need not to be isomorphic because the whole point here is we want to collapse the number of objects. So it's usually way smaller, very often way smaller. And the theorem is um, skeletons exist and they're unique up to isomorphism. They're not unique up to unique isomorphism. It's not as good, but they're unique up to isomorphism. So you could kind of say the skeleton instead of a skeleton, right? Um, and funny fact here, is kind of you can check equivalence of categories if they have isomorphisms, the isomorphic skeletons, right? You kind of go from equivalence to isomorphisms. Here. And the example where we had the example is vector space is certainly not skeletal. So um, there are zillions of different vector spaces with the same dimension. Uh, the equivalence classes here or the isomorphism classes are given by dimensions. My matrix category is skeletal. And of course it is the skeleton of uh, the category of vector spaces or finite dimensional vector spaces. And the equivalence is just given by sending x to the dimension and f to its associated matrix up to some choice of basis. Right? It's kind of the, the bare minimum. Right? So you kind of collapse objects up to a point where you can't collapse them any further without destroying really the properties of the category. That's a skeleton. And the question is kind of, is it useful or not? And it's not so easy to answer. In some sense, there's this nice over mass overflow question linked in the description, whether actually all category theory should be just about skeletons. You just focus on skeletons all the time because it's kind of fits into the philosophy of category theory that you don't care about objects anyway. So why not just collapse them until, uh, to a point where you can't collapse them any further, further anymore um, because there's just one, <laughs> one object per equivalence class. Um, and the answer is, it's, it's like with the choice of basis. So in some sense, it is very useful choosing a basis and you can do matrix calculations. In some sense, it's not very useful. Sometimes it's better to do abstract linear algebra and it's useful in the same way. So roughly speaking, I would recommend to, if the skeleton is really great or really nice, awesome, we're good to go, just use it. If it's artificial, just don't use it at all. And some categories actually are just in their natural form are already skeletal. Uh, for example, my cobordism category is an example of a category that just comes as a skeletal category that also might happen. Uh, so kind of most people would say most categories in real life, whatever that means, are not skeletal because they have kind of set-based um, categories in mind, whatever vector spaces and sets. Um, but as soon as you go to the non-set-based world, actually, a lot of categories come over in skeletal form. So that's great. So those are nice, and then skeletons are good. In set-based categories, usually skeletons are a little bit artificial. Um, the matrix category is a counterexample. The matrix category is pretty nice, uh, the matrix skeleton, and kind of the reason uh, why you see it so often in linear algebra is because it's just really, really nice, right? The matrices are pretty cool. Anyway, I already started raffling here. So um, the point about skeletons is it's too much information. You kind of collapse it to having fewer information, kind of the right amount of information on the level of objects. It fits very well into this philosophy that category theory is about errors. It might not be always a, what we want to do. Uh, skeletons might turn out to be very artificial, but it's a really cool way of thinking about ca uh, categories in general. Kind of, yes, skeletal and always exists anyway. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.